Subconscious Power, Chapter 7, Subconscious Thought. Many persons who have been brought to a realization of the important part played by the subconscious in the respective processes of physiological functioning, habitual physical action, emotional activity, and the mechanism of memory, and who gradually have become accustomed to the idea of attributing to the subconscious the direction and control of such processes, nevertheless are reluctant to admit that upon the planes of the subconscious there are performed also many important processes of actual reasoning, thought, logical induction, and deduction. Yet the performance of this last mentioned class of mental activity is as truly a function of the subconscious as are the activities previously mentioned. On the planes of the subconscious are performed many of those processes of classification, analysis, synthesis, adjustment, relation, combination, etc., which are usually regarded as being performed exclusively by the conscious mentality. Jastro well says that in addition to the simpler mental processes performed by the subconscious mentality, we must note the services that subconscious processes perform in the flow of logically associated ideas in all the complex activities incident to connected and more or less reflective thinking. Professor Elmer Gates holds that at least 90% of our mental activities are subconscious. He holds that if we analyze our mental operations, we will find that our conscious thinking is never in a continuous line, but is a series of conscious states with great intervals of unconsciousness. He bids us note that we often sit and try to solve a problem only to fail. Then we walk around, try again and again fail. Then suddenly there dawns upon us an idea that leads to the solution of the problem. The subconscious processes have been at work on your behalf. Maudsley likewise holds that a close examination and analysis will reveal the fact that consciousness is concerned in but about one-tenth of our ordinary mental operations. He states that in every mental operation, there are at work conscious, subconscious, and infraconscious mental energies, the last as indispensable as the first. Jastro directs our attention to the fact that in the affairs of our mental life, it becomes clear that some sort of selective process goes on, this implying that there is at command a collection of material from which the selection is made. He speculates concerning how far this selection and accumulation is the result of processes lying so far below the surface of consciousness that introspection fails to reveal them. He likewise points out that in all intellectual endeavor, there exists a period of incubation, a process which is in a great part subconscious, a slow concealed maturing through absorption of suitable pabulum. The same authority directs our attention to Schopenhauer's well-known statement concerning that unconscious rumination, that chewing over and over again of the cut of thought, preparatory to its assimilation with our mental tissue. The mental state or condition which another writer has referred to as the red glow that precedes the white heat. He holds that in such terms, there is implied first a process of assimilation taking place with suppressed consciousness. Second, that the larger part of the influences that in the end determine our mental growth may be effective without direct exposure to the searching light of conscious life. There is a wealth of illustrative examples supporting Schopenhauer's theory of the operation of an unconscious rumination in which the cut of thought is chewed by the subconscious. Many of these examples have been furnished to us by the voluntary statements of eminent and careful thinkers concerning their own personal experiences. So typical are many of these experiences that they need but be recited in order to awaken collection of similar experiences on the part of the readers or hearers. We ask you to consider the following several relations of experiences of this kind, culled from the often somewhat extended statements appearing in the writings of the persons referred to or expressed in conversations with their intimate friends. Von Hartmann testified to the unconscious rumination following the reading of books presenting conflicting points of view. He stated that he found that after days, weeks, or months, many of his old opinions were greatly modified and that many new opinions had replaced some formerly entertained by him. 
Thompson testified that at times he had the feeling of the uselessness of all voluntary effort and also the conviction that the matter was working itself clear in his mind. He became so accustomed to having to wait for the results of these subconscious processes that he acquired the habit of getting together enough material in advance and then leaving the mass to be subconsciously digested until he was ready to write on the chosen subject. He stated that once in his writing of his principal work, he came to a point when he could proceed no further. He stopped his work and deliberately thought about other things. One evening while reading his newspaper, the substance of the missing part of his book flashed into his mind and he began to write. He adds, this was only a sample of many such experiences. Brody said that it often happened that he had accumulated a store of facts but had been unable to proceed further with his thought on the general subject. He found by experience in such cases that after an interval of time, the obscurity and confusion cleared away. The facts had settled themselves in their right places, though he was not conscious of the intervening processes. Bascom remarked how often his conscious conclusions were based upon premises which seemed to lie beneath the plane of consciousness. He said, it is inexplicable how the mind can wittingly take up a mental movement at an advanced stage, having missed its primary steps. Galton spoke of having dragged into the light of consciousness certain whole states of mental operation that had lapsed out of ordinary consciousness. Maudsley spoke of how uncomfortable he became concerning certain obscure ideas and how there seemed to be an effort of the lost idea to get into consciousness, and of the relief experienced when the imprisoned idea finally burst into consciousness. Mozart testified that often he would not account for his musical compositions. He asserted that they frequently came to him all at once. He added, the rest is merely an attempt to reproduce what I have heard. Hamilton discovered a most important law of mathematics while one day walking with his wife in the observatory at Dublin. He had previously been unable to bring together the elements of his thought on the subject and had ceased to think of the matter. Then suddenly he felt the galvanic circle of thought close and the sparks that fell from it was the knowledge of the fundamental relations of his problem. His discovery was made. Berthelot, the great French founder of modern synthetic chemistry, once stated in a letter to a close friend that the final experiments which led to his most wonderful discoveries had never been the result of carefully followed and reasoned trains of thought, but that on the contrary, they came of themselves, so to speak, from the clear sky. Mozart was playing billiards one day when all of a sudden there flashed into his consciousness the area of the quartet of the magic flute. Fortunately for himself and for the world, he had his notebook with him and dropping his cue, he recorded the notes which had come to him in this wonderful way. A writer relates that an inventor who had been working without success upon the problem of properly constructing a prism for a binocular microscope, one day relaxed sufficiently to become absorbed in an interesting novel when lo, he suddenly conceived the elusive idea and solved the perplexing problem. Kakuli relates that he suddenly saw the atoms dancing about in midair in conformity with his evolving theory of atomic grouping while he was riding on a London bus one day with no conscious thought upon the matter of his theory. Many careful students of the phenomena of the thought processes of the subconscious have noted that the finishing touch of the subconscious digestion of a perplexing subject seems to be performed when the attention is momentarily diverted to another subject or object. Psychologists hold that in cases in which we have been unable by conscious effort of will to recall something that was previously been in the mind, try as hard as we may, we frequently achieve the desired result after we have turned the attention to something else. The missing idea coming up spontaneously without effort of will and when we are not consciously thinking about it at all. The same principle is found to apply in the processes of subconscious thought, as well as in those of memory. Many have found by experience that by deliberately employing the mind with something else, something quite irrelevant to the subject previously engaging the thought, 
they often obtain the answers sought for in vain before the diversion. As Jastrow well says, the daydream through which flashes a happy eureka or the dream of a deeper sleep that discovers the treasures that our laborious digging has failed to unearth are equally instances in which the fixed intent of the more watchful consciousness is withdrawn. Holmes holds that the automatic flow of subconscious thought is favored by listening to an uninteresting discourse containing just enough ideas in it to keep the conscious mind busy. Carpenter also holds that the subconscious process is more likely to evolve the desired result when the conscious activity is at least partially directed elsewhere. Jastrow compares this to the astronomer who sees better the star by looking a little to one side of it instead of gazing directly at it. He says, we might also say that distraction and the either moments of contemplative reverie are as essential to fruitful production as the intent periods of executive effort. The trough of the wave is as intrinsic a part of its progressive character as is the crest. We have here another instance in which it is seen that once in a while at least, it is well for the conscious mentality to refrain from actively bossing the job, then allowing the detail work to be performed by those subconscious faculties best equipped for the task. In a word, by those faculties kept by you for that particular work. But equally true is it that it is well for the boss to stay around the shop, keeping an eye on what is going on, expecting and demanding the best results and being ready to pass fair and righteous judgment upon the finished product. In the perfect coordination between the conscious mentality and the subconscious alone is to be found the balance and golden mean, which makes for efficiency. Unsupervised subconscious activity is as far from being the ideal condition as is that in which there is found the refusal to permit the subconscious the right to perform its proper and natural work. Many writers, inventors, scientists, and others performing extended and continuous mental work have testified to the fact that in one way or another, they have discovered that the faculties and powers of the subconscious may be trained to perform much of the drudgery of the intellectual work, leaving the conscious faculties free to design and to direct the general course of the task. Many men of large business affairs also have made a similar or identical discovery. Without realizing the scientific principles involved, such persons have stumbled upon methods whereby much of their work of mental digestion may be performed for them by the subconscious. These discoveries followed by a practical application of the methods adopted have resulted in such persons being able to perform what has seemed to others to be an almost incredible amount of intellectual labor while still having sufficient time and energy to plan out great enterprises and free to devote some time to amusements, games, sports, travel, and other forms of relaxation. No consideration of this subject would be complete without at least a reference to the testimony of Robert Louis Stevenson, the famous writer, concerning this very important phase of mental work. So typical and characteristic of the general principle involved are the statements of this master of the craft of writing that we feel warranted in dwelling at some length upon them in the present consideration of the subject of subconscious thought. Stevenson was fond of speaking of his subconscious mental faculties as the brownies, borrowing from the illustration from the familiar fairy tales of childhood in which are related the performances of the friendly little brownies who each night take up and complete the tasks left undone by the overworked friendly shoemaker or carpenter who has befriended the tiny creatures. He said, my brownies, God bless them, who do half of my work for me when I am fast asleep, and in all likelihood do the rest for me when I am wide awake, and foolishly suppose that I do it for myself. He relates that he had long been wanting to write a book on man's double being, and without success, had racked his brain for a plot of any sort relating to that subject. Then, one night, he dreamed the principal incidents of his great story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. These, he said, were all given him in bulk and details as he afterward wrote them in the story. He goes on to say further that often when he belabored his brains over a story needed to supply the bread and butter, 
behold, the little people began to bestir themselves in the same quest and to labor all night long to supply his wants in that direction. Often, he said, did these sleepless brownies do his honest work for him and gave him better tales than he could fashion for himself. He said that they, like him, had learned to build the scheme of a considerable story into a range of motion in progressive order. They were able to tell him a story piece by piece, like a serial, and to keep him all the while in ignorance of the outcome. Only, said he, they had more talent than he himself. But while praising the work of his little mental brownies, Stevenson does not deny the important part played by his conscious everyday mentality in his creative work. He says, I am an excellent advisor, something like Moliere's servant. I pull back and I cut down, and then I dress the whole in the best words and sentences that I can find and make. I hold the pen too, and I do the sitting at the table, which is about the worst of it. And when all is done, I make up the manuscript and pay for the registration so that on the whole, I have some claim to share, though not so largely as I do in the profits of our common enterprise. Stevenson's figurative illustration in which the faculties of the subconscious are pictured as brownies must not be dismissed as merely a fancy. Beneath the fantastic disguise with which he has dressed up the subconscious faculties, they are plainly recognizable to psychologists. They run true to form. The psychological facts are there. The processes are scientifically described. Notwithstanding the fanciful dressing, which serves to invest them with an additional interest to the non-scientific reader, and for the most scientific readers as well. Moreover, it must not be forgotten that Stevenson's dreams were quite as often daydream states as they were the ordinary dreams of the night. That even in the ordinary dreams of the night, the subconscious performs important work is attested by numerous good authorities and many instances are cited to prove the fact. We shall quote a few examples for your consideration. Coolridge composed his celebrated poem, Kubla Khan in a dream and then wrote it down when he awoke. Abercrombie relates a case in which a distinguished lawyer went to bed after studying hard over a difficult case. His wife saw him rise in the middle of the night, sit down and write a long paper, which he then put in his desk and returned to bed. Next morning, he told his wife that he had dreamt that he had written a clear and luminous opinion on the case, which he would give anything to be able to remember. His wife directed him to his writing desk, where he found the opinion fully written out, just as he had dreamed it. Schofield relates a case in which a young music pupil had great difficulty in correctly performing a difficult shake in a sonata. She was unable to master it. One night, her mother, who slept with the girl, was awakened by feeling her daughter's fingers moving on her face. She asked the girl what she was doing, but the child was asleep, though her fingers were performing the shake on her mother's face. The next day, to the amazement of her teacher, the pupil played the difficult shake perfectly and without apparent effort. The subconscious had taken over the task after having mastered it during the sleep of the girl. Holmes relates incidents of these dream helpers who are wiser than ourselves and who put thoughts in our heads and words into our mouths. Yet he holds, as do the present writers, that it is no other self that is doing the work, but rather that it is one's own self in one of its phases or aspects of manifestation. He says on this point, Dr. Johnson dreamed that he had a contest of wit with an opponent and got the worst of it. Of course, he furnished the wit for both. Tartini heard the devil play a wonderful sonata and he set it down on awakening. But who was the devil but Tartini himself? You must never lose sight of the fact that these helpers, these brownies, these other selves are but fanciful names applied to certain aspects or phases of the mental activities of yourself. You are always yourself, your whole self and nothing but yourself. All separation or division of that self is illusory and all terms indicating such separation or division are but figurative terms employed for convenience. 
All these phenomena are manifested on some of the planes or regions of your new mental empire by some of your own subordinate faculties, powers, or energies. Keep this fact always in mind and you will not be led to follow fanciful will-o'-the-wisps, which lead only to the quagmires of error and away from the main road of truth. Sometimes, however, it happens that the brilliant thoughts and ideas evolved in the deep dream states escape the conscious mentality, which upon wakening seeks to remember and recall them to consciousness or to record them in writing or speech. Nothing but a meaningless jumble of words is the result in some cases. Holmes relates an experience in which, as he states, the veil of eternity was lifted. The one great truth, that which underlies all human experience and is the key to all the mysteries that philosophy has sought in vain to solve, flashed upon me, flashed upon me in a sudden revelation. Henceforth, all was clear. A few words had lifted my intelligence to the level of the knowledge of the cherubim. Awakening, he staggered to his desk and wrote in ill-shaped, straggling characters the all-embracing truth still lingering in my consciousness. But alas, the words he wrote were merely these. A strong smell of turpentine prevails throughout. Many of us have similar experiences, which usually we are ashamed to relate, so trite, commonplace, or even absurd is the recorded conscious report. One is reconciled, however, by the generally accepted idea that although the conscious mentality is often unable to grasp and to retain, to recall and record these conceptions of the highest activities of subconscious thought, and may even be betrayed into reporting some distorted impressions made upon the waking consciousness. Nevertheless, the conception itself is impressed upon the memory records of the subconscious, thereafter to play an important part in our conscious mental life by reason of the occasional rise of the submerged ideas to the surface of consciousness. How to apply the principles of subconscious thought. One, provide proper materials. You have been shown how the subconscious undertakes and performs the important work of unconscious rumination. How it chews the mental cud composed of the materials of mental food previously supplied to it. In this unconscious rumination or chewing over the cud of thought, the subconscious performs the work of breaking into digestible form and reducing to the proper consistency the crude material of thought which has previously been furnished to it. The subconscious in this process also selects the best elements of the material furnished it, retaining this for its future work while rejecting the useless residue of the mass. Here's to be noted a most important point i.e. that just as the ruminant animal first must be furnished with the rough mass of food material, which it then proceeds to reduce to the proper consistency and condition for digestion and assimilation, so the subconscious first must be furnished with the rough material of thought, which it is expected to digest thoroughly and assimilate after it has selected from the mass the available material, the rest being rejected by it. This point has been overlooked by many investigators of the work of the subconscious. They have been so carried away by the wonderful possibilities of this process of the subconscious that they have neglected to note the antecedent conditions of this operation. In fact, some of them have practically claimed that the subconscious requires no such solid material for its processes of unconscious rumination they seemingly imply that it performs its work with the subtle materials obtained from the thin air breathed by it. But alas, this is but a dream. The subconscious can no more proceed with its processes of unconscious rumination without material than can the ruminant animal proceed to chew the cud unless it has previously partaken of the rough materials of its food. In all cases of unconscious rumination, there must be present the solid material of facts to be chewed carefully and reduced to the proper consistency by the ruminative mechanism of the subconscious. Therefore, when you wish to set before the subconscious some important and difficult task of unconscious rumination, you should first saturate your mind with the subject in question. Bring into consciousness every associated fact or related principle that is possible to you. 
Read and listen to all possible points of view on the subject, refusing to be dismayed or discouraged by the mass of contradictions. Read and listen to all possible points of view on the subject, refusing to be dismayed or discouraged by the mass of contradictions and irreconcilable different points of view, belief, or opinion. Add every possible bit of associated or related material to the general mass with full confidence that your subconscious will attend to the work of rumination, digestion, selection, and assimilation of that heterogeneous mass of mental food which you have gathered for it. Though this sometimes may seem to produce the preliminary symptoms of mental dyspepsia in your conscious mentality, do not worry. The mental stomach of the subconscious is strong and enduring and will be able to perform its task on the material which now dismays you. It possesses ostrich-like powers of digestion. In addition to the material which you thus specially supply to the subconscious, however, the latter also draws upon its own large stock of associated and related material, which it has stored on its subconscious levels or mental floors but which you have apparently forgotten. It may even go so far as to draw upon the material of the racial memory if it becomes sufficiently interested in the task and is adequately aroused by your strong desire and your firm faith in the possibilities of your subconscious. From many sources, the subconscious draws the varied materials for its cut of unconscious rumination. But nevertheless, you will fall far short of efficient performance if you fail to do your work in the matter of securing and assembling before it such useful material as you may be able to gather. From many sources, the subconscious draws the varied materials for its cut of unconscious rumination. But nevertheless, you will fall far short of efficient performance if you fail to do your work in the matter of securing and assembling before it such useful material as you may be able to gather. You must always be able to say honestly and truthfully to your subconscious, I have done the best I could for you. It is up to you to do the rest. Number two, give definite directions. Many persons who have noted the process of unconscious rumination performed by the subconscious, and also many who have acquired more or less ability to set deliberately the subconscious faculties to work along these lines, have not fully grasped the definite and clear principles involved in the process of instituting and directing the said processes. Their efforts in this direction often are conducted more or less on the hit or miss principle and are based on the belief that somehow, some way, the subconscious will work out the matter for them. Not understanding the fundamental principles involved in the subconscious processes, they are content with a more or less indefinite course of setting the thing to work. An examination of most of the cases cited in the textbooks or else related by those who have experienced subconscious phenomena of this kind will show you that the usual course is to fill the mental stomach of the subconscious with material deemed appropriate, just as one would fill the physical stomach with appropriate food and then to trust to nature or to instinct to perform the complex task of reducing the mass to the proper consistency of chemically digesting it thoroughly and of assimilating it perfectly. Such a course, as a matter of fact, frequently produced a reasonably satisfactory result. What Jastrow terms a combination of the elements into a half consistent whole results in such cases and is gratefully accepted by the individual as the best of all possible results. But although our standard modern Western psychologists have not as yet discovered and formulated a more scientific and more certain and effective method of applying the principle of subconscious mentation, those who have learned some of the secrets of the ancient oriental teachings are aware that the sages of these older schools many centuries ago evolved the true methods in question. Without attempting to go into detail and technical consideration of the theories entertained by these oriental teachers, we shall ask you to consider the practical principles of their methods. We have here another instance of the fact that underlying the often quite vague theories and metaphysical speculations of the Oriental philosophers, there may be found certain very practical methods of applying psychological principles recognized by both Eastern and Western psychology. 
the chief principle of the Oriental method is based upon the fact that there exists a manifestation of attention on the subconscious plane of mentation, as well as upon its conscious planes. Moreover, just as conscious attention may be aroused and diverted in two ways, that is one by getting interest, curiosity, desire, etc., and two by deliberate concentration of the will and voluntary attention. So may the subconscious attention be aroused and directed in a corresponding way. In both cases, attention is the active mental element involved. In most cases, such as we have previously related, the subconscious attention is directed and aroused by the power of interest, curiosity, desire, etc., which transcends from the conscious mentality to the plane of the subconscious. The general interest in the subject, the curiosity concerning the solution of the problem and the desire to reach a successful result all tend to arouse and to direct the subconscious attention and to set into activity its processes of unconscious rumination and even higher and more complex activities of the subconscious. This is the true explanation of the interesting phenomena of ordinary unconscious rumination, such as are recorded in the textbooks or experienced in everyday life by yourself. But just as the voluntary trained attention of the student and the scientist is far more efficient than the ordinary, more or less involuntary conscious attention of the ordinary person, so is the voluntary, deliberate, concentrated subconscious attention of the trained mind far superior to and far more effective than the ordinary, more or less involuntary attention of the person who has just discovered that the subconscious works, but who has not as yet learned just how it works. The delicate action of and direction by the will constitutes the distinction between the involuntary state and the voluntary state. In the case of both, the unconscious and the subconscious mental activities involved in thought. You will need but a simple, familiar example to give you the general principle involved in this matter. You know by experience that when you have strongly impressed upon your subconscious the necessity of your being awakened at five o'clock in the morning in order to catch a certain train, you may count upon something awakening you at that particular time. Or when you have an important engagement which you have apparently overlooked, something tells you that you have forgotten something just in time to allow you to rush to keep the engagement. Well then, here you have set your subconscious attention upon the task and your subconscious has been on the job for you. The same principle is involved in even the highest and most complex activities and processes of subconscious mentation in which there is something to be done. The Oriental teacher instructs his pupils to acquire by repeated practice and exercise the knack of performing the following particular mental activity. The student must formulate in his mind a clear idea of the mental task to be performed. He must perceive it in general outline and also should form a clearly defined idea of just what task he wishes to have accomplished, just what kind of work he wishes to have performed for him. He must then form a mental picture of the thought material being lowered or dropped to the subconscious levels of the mind, as for instance, being dropped through a trap door. He must then deliberately, positively, and earnestly give a mental or verbal command or direction to the subconscious mentality to perform the task for him. For instance, he must issue the command subconscious I wish you carefully and thoroughly to analyze, to classify, and logically to arrange the materials of this subject, and then to carry the reasoning concerning it to its logical conclusion. The material so passed on to the subconscious, however, must have been previously subjected to a most intense and concentrated inspection by the conscious attention. As the Oriental teachers say, it must be saturated with attention until every part of it is so permeated by attention that it carries attention in its very substance. Thought, thus energized by attention, will reawaken into being on the subconscious planes with the necessary amount of attention involved in it. This, in turn, will attract and hold the subconscious attention element of the thought. The subconscious attention once having been attracted by and directed to a subject, will never afterward release its hold on that subject 
until the latter has been brought as nearly to a successful conclusion as is possible under the circumstances. It may take only a few minutes, or it may take hours, days, months, or even years to reach the conclusion, but it will hold tenaciously to the task and will report the result eventually. Have you not received answers and reports from the subconscious concerning questions and subjects which perplexed you many years ago and which you had almost forgotten? While your conscious mentality had practically forgotten the matter, your subconscious has remembered it and has continued to work. This wonderful method is so simple that there is danger that you may overlook its great importance and its marvelous possibilities. It consists, as you have seen, of the following simple mental processes. Number one, concentrating the conscious attention upon the general problem or task until the whole subject of it is fairly saturated by attention. Two, forming the mental picture or idea of the transference of the general thought from the conscious plane or level down to that of the subconscious mentality, to the subconscious. Three, giving the subconscious the positive, clear, definite command or direction concerning what you wish it to do for you in the matter. That is all there is to it. Though several books might be filled with illustrative examples and adaptations to particular instances or special cases. Consequently, you are advised to commit to memory the above stated three stages of the methods or processing question and to apply them in any and all cases in which you desire the subconscious to proceed along the lines of the subconscious thought in a definite direction and toward a certain definite ends. The rest is all practice, 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 and exercise, exercise, and exercise. There is, however, a peculiar little mental knack about the method of giving the command or direction to the subconscious. This little knack will come to you only by practice and exercise. It cannot be expressed in words. It must be picked up in actual practice. When once acquired, it will never be forgotten by you. Charles Leland illustrated the principle of this little knack in his statements concerning what he called forethought. He says of this principle, as I understand it, it is a kind of impulse or projection of will into the coming work. I may here illustrate this with a curious fact in physics. If the reader wished to ring an old style doorbell so as to produce as much sound as possible, he would probably pull it back as far as he could and then let it go. But if he would, in letting it go, simply give it a tap with his forefinger, he would actually redouble the sound. Or to shoot an arrow as far as possible, it is not enough to merely draw the bow to its utmost span or tension. If just before it goes, you will give the bow a quick push, though the effort be trifling, the arrow will fly almost as far again as it would have done without it. Or as is well known in wielding a very sharp saber, we make the draw cut. That is, if to the blow or chop, as with an ax, we also add a certain slight pull simultaneously, we can cut through a silk handkerchief or a sheet. Forethought is the tap on the bell, the push on the bow, the draw on the saber. It is the deliberate but yet rapid action of the mind when before going to sleep or dismissing thought, we bid the mind to subsequently respond. It is more than merely thinking what we are to do. It is the bidding or ordering the self to fulfill a task before willing it. Additional illustrations will occur to the reader who is familiar with the games of golf, billiards, tennis, etc., in each of which the skillful players discover the little knack of putting something into the blow, a stroke, or whatever the movement may be. He finds that by putting that little something of himself into the movement, he adds very materially to its power, its accuracy, and its general efficiency. The principle of the little knack in the giving of commands or direction to the subconscious closely resembles the principles employed in the skilled physical movement to which we have just referred. You must learn to put a little of yourself into it. Subconscious thought may be set into activity by the method previously described under nearly any or all kinds of circumstances. 
It may be set a-going during the day or just before going to sleep at night. Leland and some others have strongly advised the last mentioned plan, claiming for its special advantages. In cases where quick decisions and actions are necessary, the process may be affected with little or no loss of time. The time necessary to flick the ashes from your cigar before answering or in which to reach out to replace an object on your desk or to perform any similar action will be sufficient for the subconscious to render you at least some degree of assistance in response to your positive command. Attend to this for me quickly at once. The subconscious is capable of the lightning-like rapidity of certain dream states in such cases. Try this method and learn for yourself how wonderfully rapid and effective is the response. Leland says, the practice of composing the plan as perfectly yet as succinctly as possible, combined with the energetic impulse to send it off, will before long give the student a conception of what I mean by forethought, which by description I cannot. And when grown familiar and really mastered, it will give to its possessor a power to think and act promptly in all the emergencies of life in a greatly increased degree. Forethought may be brief, but it should always be energetic. By cultivating it, we acquire the enviable talent of those men who take in everything at a glance and act promptly, like Napoleon. This power is universally believed to be entirely innate or a gift, but it can be induced or developed in all minds in proportion to the will by practice. Number three, refrain from interfering. In passing on to your subconscious any certain and particular work to be performed by it, you should refrain from interfering with the subconscious processes. You may and indeed should stand by as it were, ready to seek for or to furnish any additional data or facts for which it may call. And you should always exercise the right of supervision, revision, and general management, as we have already told you. But you should never meddle with the processes of the subconscious in themselves, nor should you attempt to boss the job in its details, as well as in the general direction and management. A violation of this last rule may confuse the subconscious, or in extreme cases, may even throw it into a state of panic. This is a common mistake and one especially to be guarded against. You must cultivate and manifest confidence and trust in your subconscious. The subconscious, as we have previously informed you, is as sensitive as our intelligent workers in general. In some cases, it manifests quite a show of artistic temperament and is easily disturbed by what it may deem an unwarranted meddling with its work. Exercise the iron hand upon it, if you will, but always be careful to wear the velvet glove on that hand if you wish to secure the best results from it. Sometimes the subconscious may tentatively raise to your conscious plane of mentality its unfinished work for your inspection. It wants you to tell it how you like it as far as it has gone. Give its reports and results a careful examination and add any helpful suggestions which may occur to you then send it back for completion with a word of encouragement and with that little tap on the bell, as Leland puts it. Do not make the mistake, however, of the child who having planted seeds in the garden pulls up the sprouts each morning to see how much the roots have grown overnight. You are not dealing with a lifeless mechanism, remember. You are dealing with a living intelligence, which is an aspect of yourself. Subconscious thought and logic. Some persons who have acquired proficiency in subconscious mentation, but who have wished also to acquire a knowledge of logic and logical thinking, have found themselves somewhat upset at first, after they have acquainted themselves with the principles of formal logic. They report that they have found themselves in somewhat the same general condition of the centipede mentioned in a foregoing section of this book, who had lost the natural art of running many-legged after he began to think of which leg follows which. The trouble here, however, should not be blamed upon logic. It arises rather from an attempt to take away from the subconscious all the thinking work that had previously been performed by it and to attempt now to perform this on the conscious plane alone according to the rules of logic. Had such persons continued to permit their subconscious to perform its accustomed work instead of trying to rob it of its natural tasks, 
they would have discovered that the subconscious was performing its work even more effectively than before by reason of the superimposition of the knowledge of the laws and rules of logical thought. It will be found as a rule that the subconscious thought of a logical thinker will be far more logical than that of an illogical person. One may improve the logical quality of his subconscious mentation by studying the elements and principles of practical logic. The training received thereby by the conscious mentality is reflected upon the subconscious planes. This being the case, those feeling the need of improvement along the lines of logical thinking need fear no interference with the thought processes of the subconscious. Quite the reverse is the fact, as we have said. But in studying along the lines of logical thought for this purpose, confine yourself to work on the subject of practical logic. Leave formal logic to those who are fond of the academic technical phases of the subject. Select those works in which the subject of logic is brought down to solid earth instead of being raised to the upper regions in which the clouds abound. We feel warranted in here directing to your attention that volume of this series entitled Reasoning Power, the subject of which is practical logic and the laws and rules of practical logical thought. <laughs>